Britton Croft here. It's February 10th, 2022. We have a special video for you today. Just focus on the technical slides of our new corporate presentation. I would refer you to panconresources.com for the full presentation. Today, we're just going to focus on some of the new content from our discovery model, which we referenced in our February 3rd news release. We have a special guest with us on this video, Lori Curtis. He is a director of PanCon, and he's a senior technical advisor to PanCon. Lori has a very long career as a geologist and as a corporate executive in the exploration and mining sector all over the world. Hey, Lori, thanks for joining us. Hey, you're welcome, Leighton. Great to be back. To sum up the story of PanCon right now, it is old mine plus new model equals big discovery potential. And a quick refresher, Brewer was a former producing gold mine. It produced 180,000 ounces of oxide gold in the 1980s and 90s. It's located in Chesterfield County, South Carolina in the US. Only a 15 minute drive from the producing Hale gold mine. So we're in an excellent neighborhood and we've been working for about a year and a half here under an exclusive option agreement. And uh, we've got some exciting new things to talk about here in terms of what our discovery model and our data compilation work has told us. Old mines plus new mines equals new finds. This is a new slide, and I'm going to pass the mic over to Lori. Hey, thanks, Leighton. Uh, most geologists would recognize this uh, picture, and uh, the takeaway right from the get-go is major structures, suture zones within the Earth's crust, uh, channel fluids, and our repositories for very good copper gold mineralization. I guess specifically what I'd like to just point out is that as far as investors are concerned, the, the areas that are getting a lot of traction right now are uh, the Golden Triangle, a lot of new discoveries being made there. Also majors such as BHP, Newcrest, Barrick moving in. Uh, the next uh, dot down is Arizona. And of course, there's a whole renaissance, a revolution, in fact, going on there, uh, starting with the discovery of resolution and to modern day exploration, which is finding more signs of these deeper buried porphyry copper gold systems. And in Ecuador, there's uh, a gold rush there, which is uh, was led by the salt gold discovery, but many big porphyries being drilled off here. Now, the last point I would show you is take us over to Indonesia. Traditionally, some of the youngest and biggest and globally most important deposits in this neck of the woods being discovered in the last de two decades. Uh, what is the takeaway from this? The takeaway simply is that the green dot, Eastern North America metallogenic terrain, which uh, is the ellipse that goes all the way up to Newfoundland, the circle within it, of course, our home turf. And my view is that it's potentially undiscovered Porphyry territory, given that this was a suture some 400 million years ago, and likely the next place to find some major discoveries, already discoveries, the bookends being in uh, Newfoundland and a uh, hail not far from us, but this turf here, our own turf, likely big discovery potential here. Just uh, focused in on that ellipse, as I said, the bookends being Barite Hill and our turf in Carolina, the Carolina Slate Belt, shown as the Carolina Zone there, and the gold deposits, known uh, gold and exploration projects ongoing in Newfoundland. The revival in Newfoundland being really an extension of what was known in the, the South Carolina Slate Belt in the blue there, that's been known known for uh 30, 40 years. I will point out that this whole belt, the Carolina Slate Belt, uh, was accreted or actually glued on to the North American Craton some three to 400 million years ago. And we feel that this is likely the presence of a former suture that today would be recognized as a volcanic arc, such as Indonesia, except we now are drilling through some disguised terrain and likely be going to make discoveries already hinted at by such things as Brewer, Hale, and the deposits and prospects that are currently being worked out in Newfoundland. What we're doing here is showing the magnetics reduced pole vertical derivative on the right to the geology on the left at the same scale. And I think what you'll appreciate is that there's a, in, as indicated by the white dashed lines on the right slide, there is a major suture boundary. There's a major change, if you will, between the, those two white lines as a corridor. And likely this was a former suture zone uh, along which a lot of structural movements taken place. And magmatism, of course, drives porphyries, 
drives the porphyry engine that becomes ultimately at surface the epithermal deposits that we search for. And just nice to see the confirmation that we're not just dealing with Brewer as a small deposit or hail or ridgeway uh, in a very confined fashion. We're looking at big geology. Big geology often means big deposits. And underneath this yellow cover, the coastal plain, there could very well be areas that will contain mineralization, particularly to the west side of that corridor, uh, between Brewer to the northeast and between Brewer and the boundary of that corridor. Some people sometimes ask, if there's so much great potential here in the southeast in the Carolinas, how come you know these big things haven't been found yet? Is part of the answer that this coastal sand plain cover kind of acts as kind of a blanket that's um, yeah. part to see through? It's a good question. Of course, we know alluvial gold was discovered here 150 years ago to more, but and I will take your point. The comparison is very well made with Guyana and Suriname and areas in Latin America where you have exactly the same style of, of cover. It's laterite, it's calcrete, it's it's an erosional remnant that has not been removed by glaciers. It is a cover that essentially makes the geologist blind to the underlying geology, but it, uh, clearly it's not blind to magnetics. So magnetics and other deep sounding techniques with magnetotelluric size this is the home of the geophysicist. And to your point, the more we get better at our geophysical and geochemical techniques, the more the discoveries, the next generation discoveries will be made below this blind cover. But that cover is so typical of what I've seen in Latin America. And of course, once again, it was the alluvial workings of the Garamperos in, in those countries that indicated the deeper discovery potential. And we're in the same boat here. Thanks, Lori. I'm just going to quickly point out this little inset map of the state of South Carolina up to the top right here of the slide. And it just emphasizes your point where all of this is that coastal sand plain cover. And this is that kind of contact line where you see these known deposits. So great point about the importance of geochemistry and geophysics. And that's certainly a key part of uh, PanCon strategy. You know, it's said that the best place to find a new mine is at a mine or near a mine. And Brewer is at a former mine and we're near a current operating mine. The photographs on the left are of Hale Gold Mine, which is just down the road. It's about 15 kilometers along that regional trend we talked about. And Lori, would you like to add any comments? Yeah, I mean, from a geological perspective, the thing that hits me is on the right hand side, you'll see that there was a there was a critical mineralizing event about 550 million years ago. And it's interesting to note that while that event occurred almost at the same time within geological time, uh, there are several different styles of deposit and mineralization. There's a VMS, barite hill, there's Brewer, our high sulfidation epithermal system, and there are several sediment hosted epithermal systems. To me, again, this speaks to my point about big. When you've got a specific age date bracketing a variety of different hydrothermal fluids moving through a variety of host rocks. It says big tectonics, big fluids, big zone. It's all good news to me. With respect to Brewer, I think the only thing to point out is fairly, fairly high high grade. I mean, it's a decent grade and the strip ratio is quite low, both positives. It's a brilliant slide. I mean, to most, to some investors, it'll look complex, but uh, what I would ask you to consider as we're looking at a cross section of the Earth's crust. We've got a heat engine below, uh, which is indicated in pink and on the right slide by an intrusive body, which can be made up of multiple intrusives. By the way, they don't have to just be vertical. They could be represented by a series of dikes or sheets, which give rise to different things. But we're, we're making it simple here, the champagne glass model or the telescope, as we call it. Uh, on the left side, what really is important to understand is the blue zone, which is known as the quartz porophyllite zone in porphyry mineralogy uh, parlance is the heat zone, the area where the fluids start pushing out the gold and silver. And on the right side, you'll see that zone is represented by vertical blue bars there. Now, what's important to understand is that the disguise in this system is represented by the, the yellow line. That is the base of what we call a lithocap. The lithocap is just wholeheartedly obliterated volcanic material that's been affected by the hydrothermal fluids as they pushed up through from, from the magma, which is yet to be sourced, and altered all the rocks, but at the same time through structures 
provided uh, mineralization. The Brewer Pit would be on the orange line where we've inferred the older, the erosional surface, right where it intersects the blue uh, area up in there, yes, yeah, somewhere about in there. That's our interpolation. All of which is to say that we've got the entire system preserved with the litho cap and the heat engine below us at some depth. We're starting to see it at 250 to 300 meters, we're starting to see indicators that it's down there, which is the massive potential of Brewer. But also we know that these veins, which were mined 20, 30 years ago, represented where Leighton is pointing. Uh, that's that's just the upper manifestation of these mineralizing fluids. And I also have to point out that because it's so old, this is an unusual age for a porphyry copper gold system. There's likely a lot of structural translation going on in here things that we need to decipher. But it's all good news. We've got the whole system and we're starting to understand it now. We now, having gone back to our drill core with various techniques, have a much better understanding of the zonation and the fluids and the fluid pathways. You could spend a lot of time on this slide. I'm cognizant of time, but this blister, as I, I referenced it, uh, uh, it is a, it's a great slide to show the Brewer litho cap that we've just talked about but also now in its topographic entirety. And what you see, in fact, is it is a topographic high, and it's represented here as leached volcanics. In brackets, secondary quartzite, really what it's telling you is the fluids were so voluminous and so powerful and loaded up with uh, acid and fluorine, a bunch of other things, that they just le leached everything out of that rock except the silica. So it formed this very robust mushroom that we know as the lithocap and within which underneath the brewer mine itself was emplaced. So beautiful representation of the entire system in 3D. You'll also notice that it is concentrically surrounded by a quartz sericite pyrite halo, which is in the blue. And that that's an indicator of just how big this system is. And you can see it's easy two by two or four square kilometers of, of alteration and uh, likely even greater. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is the topography shows uh, that there's some pretty strong north-south uh, structures of the east flank of the Brewer mine there. There's a scarp, that's the one there, and another one just to the west, which is uh, sub-parallel to that. And the final uh, observation is that there's some obvious northwest-southeast structural features going on there. Leighton will point that out. It starts from Jefferson in the northeast, the Jefferson uh, and the red dot being yeah. up here. This mm -hmm. one, Leighton, I gather, is where we were first drilling several years ago. Yes. And if you bring that southwest down towards the arrow, you end up in a prospect called Buzzard, which is another gold prospect with with a similar but yet different uh, rock types to Brewer, but very important to show that Brewer itself seems to be in place along a northwest corridor in conjunction with a north-south corridor. And that's very typical of big deposits in Chile, big deposits in New Guinea, and deposits, uh, for example, Bingham Cannon, the biggest deposit that you can observe from the space shuttle, is on a major feature. That makes for big deposits. We started our option agreement in April 1, 2020. Since then, this is the progress we've achieved to date. We've done a compilation of historic data. We've done initial geophysical surveys. We've done shallow rotary air blast or RAB drilling. We've done sonic drilling through the loose backfill material that was reclaimed in the former pits. And of course, we've done diamond drill hole core drilling. The first thing we did is historic data compilation, and we took 48,000 data points from the historic mine from the blast holes and the assay results, and we modeled them, which helped us understand where the gold was located when they mined it. And there's a blast hole and grade shell model, and you can see that represented here on this slide. Lori, did you want to add anything? I will up a slide to the left. The blast hole data revealed to us for the first time the internal structure of what was in the, the pit. And there's very definitely post-mineral faults. You can also see the zone that is close to our polishing pond, which has also got alteration. And, and we feel that there's a strong trend in that direction that, that we need to follow up. The eastern arm that comes out towards the fault zone that, that I feel is there, and that was mined by the old timers, and there are a lot of alluvials out in that direction. And so we feel that that potentially is an area where fluids were sourced. 
And overall, a blast hole data has just proved invaluable. The shot to the lower right is, is a kind of a bubble shot of the three-dimensional aspects of the mineralization as we've been able to model it now. So it's giving us a better sense of the layer cake and of the depth extension of the mineralization that's extremely shallow to date. It's helping a lot in terms of understanding our third dimension. There were 1,020 shallow drill holes drilled over the, the past decades. The average depth was only 36 meters. They were just skimming the surface. When we refer to the previous mine, the Brewer mine, it was strictly looking for that oxide gold and they processed it using a cyanide heap leach operation. I think you're right. 100 feet is nothing these days. And look, considering that uh, deposits that are being found now in Arizona and elsewhere are one to two kilometers deep, this is virgin territory. We've drilled almost 200 rab holes, and these colored cylinders kind of represent where we drill these rab holes. And this kind of shows you the alteration in geochemical do domains to help us better understand bedrock and alteration mapping. This kaolinite perophyllite topaz zone here in, in an orangey, orange brown color, you notice that how many holes, the rab holes, have that to alteration. And that's very significant because it's that alteration that we're keying into. It's the alteration we know represents the heat and the fluids and likely vertical derivatives thereof, uh, probably a great indicator of the extent of the fluids in terms of hundreds and hundreds of meters that are outside the pit. So it essentially just opens our eyes. The corridor that's tracking through there is a single line along a road, and that gave us a much better indicator, certainly as we head to the northwest. The, the brown is increasing, and it's that zone up in there, the north target, that is very, very exciting. Excellent tool. We drilled a total of six vertical sonic drill holes. There's four represented here, but this slide here shows that there is gold in that reclaimed material in the pits, and it's averaging about 0.35 grams per ton. This slide also shows that we have a pretty good understanding of what's in that reclaimed pit. And it seems to be pretty homogenous in terms of uh, where it came from. HLP stands for heap leach pad and layer of waste rock here. So we have a pretty good sense of the uh, homogeneity of the reclamation effort. By the way, that does corroborate the documentation at site. I'm just pleasing to see that the waste rock is mineralized. So the previous operators were given away or for free here for us, if we can scalp that out. It's uh, quite strongly mineralized. And even some of the earlier material that was put in the base of the pit from the heap leach pads uh, got significant mineralization. And the fact that it's layer cake is also good news because it means if we can go back to reclaim this stuff and process it, it is stratigraphically competent. I would only add one more thing that if we do do that and take this material out, we believe that there's a value to be created from monetizing the gold that's in it. But also our working hypothesis is that by doing so, it might alter the hydrology at site and greatly reduce the acid leaching and the acid mine drainage that has been needed to be kept clean for the past 20 years. So that could be kind of a double benefit benefit to, to doing that. That's a little in the future, but this is something that we're starting to think about. Absolutely. And it's been done by many companies out there now. Reprocessing of previous tailings and waste rock is a bona fide way to uh, make money particularly as the price of gold rises. We have drilled and reported all results on 17 drill holes. And the thing that I want to point out is that, or two things. One, you can see that out of 17 holes in a, in a maiden drill program, only five out of 17 of our first holes have no significant uh, mineralization, meaning gold or copper values. To me, that's noteworthy. It's very positive, And I think we're onto something. The second thing here is looking at grade and thickness, often a very important and useful way to think about the prospectivity uh, from drill results in a program, especially an early program like ours. And so anything that's this color, the pink is above 100 GT. That's very good. And you can see the legend here. And you can see just some of these initial holes are quite compelling in terms of GT. Of those 17 drill holes, here we're highlighting some of the most exceptional 
higher grade intercepts and holes. And you can see here how they're color coded here to match with the colors over here. Um, and again, the same grade times thickness GT legend down here shows you that we've got some good high grade intervals from our initial round of drilling. Yes, yeah, a surprising number of really good hits there. I mean, let's face it, 25 meters of a gram is a good hit. There's a Plenty of people who would aspire to have that. Uh, and uh, these are, in fact, some of them are up to four to five times better than that. So a, gr a great start and also really pleasing to see the number of holes that are outside the old pit boundaries that are also economic. They're the ones in yellow and that particularly the one down there, 15. Hole 15 down here is unique to these other holes. This is about 150 meters south of the former mine. But it's a true step out hole, but it is a real encouraging sign. And it's helped us with our new discovery model about the Southern sort of target area. And it's an important data point in that. This is a cross section view to the West. What I just said was of that hole 15 and there it is. It's open in all directions. You can see the historic drilling up here, quite shallow as we've talked about. And then PanCon's holes over here. It's uh, pleasing to see that while it looks very simple, it took a lot of effort, I'm sure, to create this slide by going through all the drill holes and understanding the alteration. So what is important about alteration is it really gives you a chemical and thermal gradient. As minerals change, they're simply reacting to the fluids that move through them. And ideally, you want to be in the carapace, which means the the shell around the, the highest temperature material or the telescope that comes up from that where it creates this gradient and as it creates the gradient mineralization is precipitated depending on the thermal gradient. So the bullseye there, the residual quartz with topaz represents, as we know it right now, the vortex of the fluids as we currently know. And remember, we're only drilling three, 400 meters max and mostly 100 to 200 meters. So we're still trying to understand this, but the old pit boundary, you can see great coincidence with that residual quartz topaz, but you also see that it moves to the northwest, up to the northwest target area. We know down plunge, it seems to, to go to the west, to the western target area. We know the new discovery that Leighton's talked about is in this corridor called the southern target area, which is essentially an east-west corridor that we saw at first in some of the old blast hole data, but now we recognize it a lot better. And that corridor heads out towards this nor-nor-west structural feature that is and the nor nor west one and the one on the east there Leighton it's the along the that boundary fault there I call it yeah moving in a northwesterly direction also note that the zonation goes from a residual quartz topaz topaz meaning um, aluminum but also fluorine and very high temperature and acid it moves outward as it decreases in temperature into this KPT which is a slightly lower temperature and much more voluminous and also indicative of underlying fluids. And then finally into a more what we call distal or white mica kaolinite zone, which uh, uh, I won't get into its formation, but but it's also part of the system. It's just that it's lower, lower thermal gradient. I was pleased to see this because it focuses you in on the bullseye, but it also shows that our future also can lie to the Northwest and it can also plunge underneath us to the South. So, uh, on that previous uh, plan, there is a section line, um, A A. So, here's a slice through the geology as we understand it right now. Immediately um, below the pit area, you see the residual quartz topaz I've referenced. It's got root zones that we believe tap down and possibly join or flare out towards the discovery that, that's shown to the right, the, the large balloon or purple that we see to the right there. Not difficult uh, to imagine that that could easily be joined in some way. We're not sure how yet. A reason that fla the flare out stops is at this point is that there's a vertical dashed line there that Patrick believes is some kind of a fault that's actually coming out of the plane at an acute angle to us. And these are the kind of things we, we need to focus on. But you get also the sense of the thermal gradient. On the left side of the slide, we go from a lower temperature quartz mica, what we call retrograde chloride carbonate, into as we warm up into this bluer zone where we get kaolinite, which is also indicative of the acid fluids moving through finally into the green, which is uh, the, the felspars are being altered and it's higher temperature, we're getting the white mica. And then into this large swath of ochre orange color, which is 
almost complete destruction and removal of most uh, iron and magnesium and other minerals and replacement or, or residual quartz. And this is our focal area, of course, the purple being where we want to be or where we start, where somewhere in this whole swath of orange, we're going to find areas of mineral. And in fact, the right hand portion of the slide shows a picture of drill core in the middle of the sea of, of KPT alteration. And that rock is a beautiful looking breccia with fragments of um, volcanic that has been impregnated with sulfide, totally leached with silica, a geologist's dream here. Beautiful rock, no doubt. In indicating to us that we're in the right terrain here to be finding a big discovery. There's also another, I would call it, it's a darker orange blob towards A. That's another area that Patrick has delineated and it, he feels, plunges into the page, or in other words, to the west, and is maybe the top of our west anomaly within this section, but it's moving underneath the old waste dumps. And this is hole 15 that we've talked about earlier right here. So there's a lot going on here, but again, I want to underscore that there is so much data and so much analysis uh, behind and underpinning this single image. And it's such a powerful exploration tool for us and a map and a pathway for guiding our next steps of what we're going to do to continue um, drilling and hopefully make some big discoveries. So what we've done here is we've done an IP chargeability uh, logging of a series of transects structures. And you'll see the colors ranging from blue to red to green, which is increasing chargeability from the gray to the pink. What that means is, in simple terms, is got more disseminated sulfides, the signal when it's put into the earth, causes that sulfide material to charge and that, that charge, it's measured by various techniques. You will see it initially looks a little distracting, but let's look at the southern target area. You'll see that in fact, the reds quite clearly define that corridor, which is pleasing. Patrick and I have discussed this. That appears to be an anomalous east-northeast structure that is chargeable, has sulfide, and of course our hole 15 is right on the flank of that. You'll see under the pit that there's also chargeable areas, but interesting enough, as you go away from the pit to the north, you get into blue. And my feeling of the blue is that this is more resistive rock, which is essentially the barren silica. The sulfides themselves are non-existent, or they may also have been leached, and you get very low chargeability. So you've got the dichotomy of sulfides with high, highly chargeable that may be coincident with mineralization, but you also have areas of resistance, which is in, indicative of leaching and high silica, which is the fluid pathway. Not an easy one to interpret and it's not an easy one when you've got waste and a lot of cultural noise but we're working at this and Patrick and Leighton will talk to the plans for the future on this but it's a very helpful tool for us. We did four total lines of, of IP back in 2020. The fourth one is not shown here. It was over here to the west. Our next steps are going to include another round of IP geophysics, but it'll be much more comprehensive in nature and much more fulsome in terms of the coverage we get. And we are intending for it to also look deeper. So it'll build on what we've done but hopefully help us really flesh out and refine our, our these target. We talk about target areas, but that new um, round of geophysics should be very, very helpful. The topic I was just talking about, which is our proposed geophysics. And you can see here on the right, a nine square kilometer grid of uh, IP geophysics is our plan. Uh, you can see here the green background represents the Brewer property. It's about a thousand acres. The blue represents the Jefferson project, which is what PanCon has 100% ownership of. And here's the brewer pit in the middle. I'm excited to see that we're planning such a big survey. It's a challenge, but I do believe we have to reach way beyond Brewer. We have to pick up the challenge and make our search ellipse much bigger. And this is the, the first attempt to, to in fact do that. As I've pointed out time again, these, these systems can occur over 10 to 15 kilometers pearls on a string. So we need to step out of our comfort zone and this is a great start. Thanks, Laurie. That's a great comment. I do want to note though, that as we've been talking about the Northwest target area right here, the Western target area here and the Southern target area here. And of course the, the target area below the former mine right here, all those four target areas are well within PanCon's current footprint and the, the land that we control exclusive rights to explore. We know that this is a big system and we're very glad that in advance of winning the tender 
in 2020 to explore Brewer itself, this green area, we had already acquired land around it. So we feel like we've got a great footprint on which to explore and that all of our target areas fit uh, well within those boundaries. When we talk about next steps, where our plan is geophysics and then drilling. So this is right now, I think we feel really good about our target areas. But again, that geophysics, which will come before the drilling should really allow us to enhance and refine and optimize the drill targets and possibly help us, especially at depth and perhaps particularly up here in the Northwest in the fourth target area, identify new drill targets. All right. Well, that wraps up our discussion today with uh, Lori Curtis. It, this has been uh, a rather long video. It's very technical, um, but I think it's very important that even non-technical people, non-geologists like myself, listen and see and understand the kinds of things that we've talked about today. I think Lori does a great job of explaining it in simple to understand language, but it also underscores the importance of data and modeling and analysis. And so I think that the, the trajectory that we're on is great. I'm so excited about the new discovery model that we have and the information and, and what it's telling us to do. So I will thank you again for your time today, Lori. And with that, it's all for now. Bye, Leighton. Thanks very much.